Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the vasoactive intestinal peptide and pituitary adenylate cyclase activating protein receptors. Okay, so we've seen that the activation of those G-protein coupled receptors by their ligand leads to the activation of GS heterotrimeric G-proteins, which activates adenylyl cyclase enzymes, which produce cyclic AMP. Okay, we now want to see how cyclic AMP is going to activate our protein kinase A holoenzyme. Okay, so we've got our protein kinase A holoenzyme bound here, well, here, okay, it's either a type 1 protein kinase A holoenzyme, in which case it will be floating around in the cytoplasm, or it's a type 2 protein kinase A holoenzyme, in which case it will be bound to the A kinase anchoring proteins. Okay, right, uh, so, the activation of both type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A holoenzymes is the same. What happens is when cyclic AMP levels go up within the cytoplasm, okay, and now we're going to demote cyclic AMP to just being represented as a little blob, which I'm going to colour in in which colour I not used. We could use yellow, I don't know if it'll show up though. Um, yellow, there we go. Okay. Um, the cyclic AMP is going to bind these cyclic AMP binding domains on the regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. Now, each regulatory subunit of protein kinase A has two binding domains for cyclic AMP. So two cyclic AMP molecules are going to bind here and here, and two cyclic AMP molecules are going to bind here and here. The effect of that is to change the conformation of the regulatory subunits so that it now releases the catalytic subunits. Okay, so let me show you this. So, uh, we will still have uh, the docking and dimerization domains of our two regulatory subunits within the regulatory subunit dimer bound together. Okay, so that hasn't changed. These two remain bound together, so I'll colour them in in turquoise again. And if we're talking about a type two protein kinase A uh, holoenzyme, in which the regulatory subunits within the regulatory subunit dimer are type 2 regulatory subunits, then this dimer of the dimerization, sorry, the docking and dimerization domains will remain bound to the A kinase anchoring protein. So what I mean by that is even once you've activated the protein kinase A holoenzyme and triggered this conformational change, the regulatory subunit dimer will remain bound to the A kinase anchoring protein if it's bound to an A kinase anchoring protein. Okay, so here then now are the protein kinase A inhibitor sites, and they're no longer going to have the catalytic subunits bound to them. Okay, so the catalytic subunits have been released into the cytoplasm. Okay, and now cyclic AMP is bound to these cyclic AMP binding sites, and it's caused a conformational change in the regulatory subunit. And the most dramatic way I can show a conformational change is by going from being in this L shape here to being uh, straight, like so. Okay, so then we'll have a carboxylic acid terminus over here, and then a carboxylic acid terminus at this side as well. Okay, now we've got cyclic AMP molecules bound in all four of these sites here. Okay, so I'll start by colouring in the cyclic AMP molecules, and then I'll colour in the cyclic AMP binding sites. So here in yellow, those are the four cyclic AMP molecules, and then we've got the four cyclic AMP binding sites here in blue now. Okay, one, two, the third one over here, and then finally a fourth one here. Okay, so that now is the activation of the regulatory subunits by the binding of cyclic AMP, okay? And what the regulatory subunits are therefore going to do is release the catalytic subunits from them. Now, as soon as the catalytic subunits are released from the regulatory subunits of the protein kinase A uh, holoenzyme, they are now capable of actually catalyzing the addition of phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues. Okay, so let's just discuss what it means to phosphorylate serine and threonine residues. So, let me draw you a serine residue and then a threonine residue. So here's the amino uh, group of our amino acids. I'm just drawing the core amino acid structure at the moment. Okay, and I'm drawing it as though it's within a polypeptide. That's what it may, means to say I'm going to draw the serine residue. When you say you're drawing an amino acid residue, it means that you're drawing the amino acid as though it's in a larger polypeptide rather than just drawing the free amino acid. 
Okay, so here's the core structure of an amino acid residue, and then the R group of a serine amino acid residue consists of a methylene group with an alcohol group coming off it, like so. Okay, and for threonine, it will consist of something very, very similar. So here, once again, is the core amino acid structure. Okay, here's the carboxylic acid group. And this time, you've got a carbon with an alcohol group coming off it, exactly the same, a hydrogen down here, and then a methyl group coming off this carbon as well. So very similar. This is the structure of threonine amino acid residue, whilst this is a serine amino acid residue. And these catalytic subunits of protein kinase A are going to phosphorylate both of these types of amino acid residue. Okay, so let me show you what this actually means. So basically, we're going to add phosphate groups onto these alcohol groups of the serine and threonine residues. Now, what is the structure of a phosphate group? Well, basically, a phosphate group consists of a phosphorus atom at the center, double bound to an oxygen atom with two alcohol groups uh, coming off the sides. Okay, and then another single bond to an oxygen atom down here, which then has to acquire a final electron via ionic means and therefore has a negative charge. Okay, so what you can do basically is you can bind phosphate groups onto alcohol groups and this reaction is very similar actually to an esterification reaction in which you bind carboxylic acid groups to alcohol groups because if we look at this group that I'm circling in blue here, we have a phosphorus atom double bound to an oxygen atom then with an alcohol group coming off. If we change that phosphorus atom to a carbon atom, that group that I've circled in blue would look very much so like a carboxylic acid group, okay? And indeed, this carboxylic acid-like group can interact with the alcohol groups in pretty much the same way that a carboxylic acid group would, okay? So the alcohol group can come off the phosphorus atom, okay? The hydrogen can come off the alcohol group here of the serine residue, okay? Those two can combine together to make water, and then what we're going to do is link the oxygen of the alcohol group of the serine residue to the phosphorus atom of the phosphate group, okay? And that link, to show its parallels with an ester link, is called a phosphoester link. Okay, right. Now, in reality, these catalytic subunits are not going to take pure inorganic phosphate groups like this from the cytoplasm and stick them onto serine and threonine residues. Instead, what they're going to do is they're going to take ATP molecules, they're going to cleave the final phosphate group off the ATP molecules, the gamma phosphate group, and they're going to transfer that onto the alcohol group. And the reaction, as you can imagine, is exactly the same for threonine down here. Um, Okay, so that's what it means to phosphorylate serine and threonine residues. And it can change the um, activity of proteins hugely, okay? It can affect their folding, it can affect their activity. So modulation but of protein function, structure and function, by phosphorylation via these catalytic subunits of protein kinase A can trigger a plethora of different downstream pathways. Now, what I want, the last thing I want to discuss is which serine and threonine residues on proteins are phosphorylated. Do the catalytic subunits just phosphorylate any serine and threonine residue? Okay, so if we think about this, let's say this is our polypeptide here. There are going to be a lot of serine and threonine residues throughout the length of some proteins. Do you phosphorylate all of them? Well, the first answer is obviously no, because some of them might not be visible to the catalytic subunits. You know, if this is, this is going to fold up into some elaborate structure, and some of these residues will be hidden in the depths of this structure and just will not be visible. Okay, so for physical reasons, these catalytic subunits simply cannot get access to some of the residues. But even the ones that they have access to, they don't phosphorylate all of them. In fact, they only phosphorylate serine and threonine residues if they're within a certain recognition sequence that tells the catalytic subunit to phosphorylate that serine and threonine residue. Now, what are these recognition sequences? Okay, well, let me tell you about them. Let's say that we have an amino acid here, okay? And this amino acid is either serine or threonine, 
Okay, and the free letter amino acid codes for serine is sir, and threonine it's THR like so. Okay, and we want to decide, is the catalytic subunit going to phosphorylate the serine or threonine? Well, the first thing is, let's say it is exposed to the cytoplasm, so the catalytic subunit can find this, okay? The question then becomes, will it phosphorylate this now that it can? Okay, well, basically, in order for this catalytic subunit to phosphorylate the serine threonine residue, it matters what is in front of the serine threonine residue. Okay, so there are certain sequences that you need in front of the serine or threonine residue to tell the catalytic subunit to phosphorylate that serine or threonine residue. Now, it doesn't actually matter at all which amino acid is directly in front of the serine or threonine residue. So the amino acid in front can actually be anything, so I'll just put an X there. But the one that is two in front and the one that is three in front, these make the total difference, okay? So these are the ones that the catalytic subunit is going to look at, the one that is two in front and the one that is three in front. Okay, and in order for this serine threonine to be phosphorylated, both of these two amino acids here have to either be arginines or lysines, okay? So if you want to decide whether this serine or threonine is going to be phosphorylated, you need to look at the amino acid 2 in front of that. You need to check, is it an arginine or a lysine? If so, tick the box. Then look at the one that's free in front. Ask again, is it an arginine or a lysine? If the answer is yes, tick the box. Okay, and both of these can be either an arginine or a lysine. They don't need to be the same. So let me make this as blatant as possible. The sequences then that will be phosphorylated by the catalytic subunit of protein kinase A are, for instance, you could have arginine, arginine, okay, so both of them are arginines, then the one directly in front of it is anything, and then the final one is either a serine or a threonine, okay, so that sequence would result in the serine or threonine here being phosphorylated but they don't have to be the same. So you could have arginine followed by a lysine, followed again by anything, and then your serine or threonine, and again, that will result in the serine threonine being phosphorylated, or it could be the other way around. You could have a lysine free in front, and then, whoops, an arginine uh, two in front here, uh, and then anything one in front, okay? and then your serine and threonine, and that would result in the serine threonine being phosphorylated, or alternatively, both of them could be lysines. So you could have lysine, lysine, then anything, and then your serine and threonine, and again, that would result in the serine threonine being phosphorylated. Okay, so that's to end with, just have a little bit of a revision of what the structure of arginine and lysine are. Okay, so once again, here is our core amino acid structure, uh, drawn again as though it's within a polypeptide, okay? And then the R group of lysine consists of uh, four methylene groups, and because I don't want to have to draw four methylene groups, I'm going to um, bracket them once again and subscript four, like so, and then an amino group on the end. So that's the R group of lysine. So this is the amino acid lysine, okay? And the three-letter code for lysine is lys, like so. And then arginine, which I'll require a bit more space for, which is why I've left this one to last. Okay, again, here is the core amino acid structure, like so. And then the R group of arginine consists of three methylene groups, which I'll show here. So there's one methylene group, and again, I don't want to have to draw three of them out, so I'll bracket them and then subscript it three, like so. Then we have a nitrogen atom with a hydrogen coming off, then a carbon coming off that, an amino group coming off the carbon here, and then a double bond to a nitrogen atom here, which then has a hydrogen coming off, okay? And this is the structure of the amino acid arginine, uh, and the three-letter code for arginine is arg. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of uh, the VIP uh, and PACAP or PACAP receptors, okay? Um, they will overall uh, activate uh, GS, heterotrimeric G proteins, which then activate adenylyl cyclase enzymes, which then activate protein kinase A enzymes, which will phosphorylate serine and threonine residues on a whole plethora of targets and cause the downstream uh, pathways of that. Okay, 